All right, Sophie Lou. Hello. Hello, welcome. I am ecstatic to talk to you. I put out a post. You probably didn't see that post. I'm not sure if you're on TikTok, but <laughs> I am not. <laughs> <laughs> A 42-year-old man asking you why you're not on TikTok (laughs) is not a conversation I want to get into. (laughs) I have a complicated relationship with social media. I battle it every day. (laughs) To be very honest with you, that's where I'm using my social media platform to bring in experts and incredible people that probably do not have the time or patience to be on social media. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. And there's actually like a fun joke. I don't know if it's vets in particular or just like my group of vet friends, but we are like allergic to technology. We just, we have so many things going on in our brain that we're juggling. We're just like, if this doesn't work the first time, I don't want to deal with it. It's just, we're bad. We're great, but we're bad. I think if a busy, successful expert jumps on social media, it's probably indicative of a midlife crisis. (laughs) Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. But I I was really excited to talk to you. So I did a post. I've ran into a couple of dogs, three or four dogs in the last uh, year and a half, two years where I could tell I had met my match or reached a limitation with what I could do with my skill sets with this animal and noticing the real sensitivities and the real inability to self-regulate wanted to find a good vet behaviors. And I've come across or I've come in at the tail end of a lot of dogs that for whatever reason, they weren't able to move forward in a successful process with vet behaviors. Mm-hmm. So I wanted a referral for somebody that, could, that I could use as a referral. And your name came up unanimously. Oh, well, thank you. And I don't know if you know how TikTok works. It's not like Facebook <laughs> where everybody's friends, cousins, and nephews. <laughs> I Yeah, I am so bad at like modern social media. We call Facebook dog book because for us older ladies of a different generation, I'm not that old, but my brain is. So <laughs> that's where we hang out and I have yet to make that leap. So, so this is really interesting. This is like a whole new world. They know you already. So in my comment section, it was Sophie Lou. And I thought, because the way TikTok works, it goes everywhere. It goes all around the world and back. And everybody's Sophie Lou, Sophie Lou. And then Amy Cook DM me and went Sophie Lou. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. Okay. Sophie Lou it is. Oh, thanks, Amy. Of course, Amy's doing social media well. (laughs) She's killing it. If you have a moment, watch Amy Cook on a live completely obliterating trolls for an hour and a half. I love it's hilarious. It. Oh my God. I love it. <laughs> love it. <laughs> so with that, I wanted to, obviously we've talked in terms of referring out some dogs, but in realizing I myself not knowing where I end and where a vet behaviorist begins and also mm-hmm. on the broader issue of dog owners and the mm-hmm. varied issues that they might be having with extreme behavior, what exactly does a vet behaviorist do? When do we start asking these questions and look for professionals such as yourself to bring the training and the potential medication protocol element into play? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So much to dig into. And okay, how do we start? So I think it's such a big, complex topic that involves breeding, rearing, what is normal behavior? What is atypical behavior? When do we intervene? What do we accept? What is a good quality of life? Well, then what are medications? What can medications do? What is the rate of efficacy? There's so much to dig into here. I think one of the easiest ways that I start explaining it, for example, to clients is if you just think about the diversity of brains that we have in human beings. Dogs have the same functional basic brain structures. And there's actually been a lot of literature about dog, dog behavior, working dogs, like search and rescue dogs, because especially dogs who have a purpose, 
there's like for working roles, guide dogs, service dogs, military law enforcement dogs, there's actually been a ton of research funded into them because it's a lot of money to breed, raise, train. And the wash rate is, is still pretty high in a lot of situations. So that's a lot of money to be throwing at a resource. That's what they're considered to ultimately have 50% of it not be useful, right? So what I start with is that we actually know a lot about dogs and dog brains and dog cognition. There's a lot we still have yet to figure out, but there's a lot we do know. And we we very clearly see quote unquote pathologies in dogs that are very similar to humans. Like anyone with an anxious dog knows there's something different about this dog. I have many clients who come to me, they're like, retire, they've had dogs their whole lives, and then they decided to adopt this poor little rescue dog that came from Central Valley in California. And they're like, we could just love it and it'll be fine. And the dad was like, I've never met a dog like this. It's been three months and I still can't touch this dog. There's something different about this dog. And so I think if you haven't had the experience, it's easy to be like, oh, it's just on in how you raise them. You just need a bit more obedience training or whatever. But anyone who's actually experienced it can tell you like, this is a little bit outside the bounds of normal. And when I think about how we approach this, I like to start with this concept of that there is a diversity of brains in dogs, just as there are in people. And if you've ever experienced a, a state of being anxious, for a prolonged period of time or a state of being in a toxic work environment for a prolonged period of time where it starts to give you a negative bias, where it starts to make you anticipatory of negative consequences, where it starts making you hide things or lie or do things as defensive mechanisms. If you have personally experienced that and you recognize that their brains can experience that too. And if you then also have maybe experienced it from a very early age or have seen people who have struggled or had these challenges for a very long time, you understand like this is a more complex issue of genetics and rearing and social expectations. And sometimes in people and in dogs, it becomes challenging to go forward with changing your behavior with training, with behavior modification, if you don't also have some potential psychopharmaceutical help. And I think it's really important to recognize that it's not all in how you raise them. Genetics is a huge factor of the dog that's in front of you. Early enrichment and early socialization is also a huge factor in that. And then so what you get as, let's say, a one-year-old rescue dog that maybe had um, parents who were not selected, but weren't selected against fear or anxiety or whatever, if they weren't selected against really high levels of impulsivity, of potentially flipping quickly over into defensive aggression. And then they also didn't have early intervention. If your child has issues emotionally regulating and that never goes addressed until they're like 14 years old that's you're gonna have really big problems right and so with a dog that maybe came from a a background where those specific traits weren't selected against so they're allowed to exist and they didn't have early intervention and then you finally get it as an adolescent with very ingrained behavioral habits and ingrained emotional biological brain pathways, there's, I, I think there's only so much you can do without some extra help. Um, if that dog has a, has now a different brain type than the majority of the rest of our dogs. And as veterinary veterinarians who specialize in behavior, who have a special interest in behavior, our job is to understand the full spectrum of behaviors and brains that exist in dogs, to understand what behaviors your dog is showing and what that might be indicative of. And then to ideally give a diagnosis that we can then justify use of meds if indicated. Um, And if medications aren't indicated, then we might steer you towards, you know, altering your behavior mod this way or that way, or like maybe this is the extent of what we can expect of your dog, you know? So 
We also do counsel on behavioral euthanasia because I think that is something we don't openly talk about enough, but I think that everyone across the spectrum recognizes it's necessary sometimes um, when there's a really critical potential um, public safety risk or risk to another creature or human or whatever. And so we counsel on all of those things about recognizing what's in front of you, recognizing the extent of what behavior mod and or medications, if justified, can do. And then is that sufficient to live a good quality of life for the dog, for the humans, for society? That's a great answer. Two questions for you. What is the ratio my own curiosity here. What is the ratio of dogs that you meet where medication is not needed? Just a training protocol, would you say? Yeah. So I think that for me, especially people filter themselves out. So I tend to see like they've already tried everything else. Everybody has already tried CBD, for example. Like everybody has already tried everything before they come to me. And so for me, I'm like, yeah, this looks like a pretty severe case of anxiety. We can talk about medications. For So for me, because I think that's what gets filtered to me, the ratio is pretty low. I would say one in 20. I will say, mm, this is a gray area. You've got like a, there's this one border terrier no not sorry boston terrier that i saw as a younger puppy and i was like this is just a really cool working dog he's on the edge he's in that gray area but if you didn't want to if you weren't super motivated for it i don't think it's totally necessary here's behavior mod here's enrichment things that we can do here's some sports you might want to consider but i think the ratio is pretty low like maybe one in 20 where we'll have this conversation i'll say mm. I don't, I, I think it's a gray area. And if you're not super motivated, I think the justification is a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. yeah. And is there such a thing as temporary medication protocols to marry with the training versus uh, a lifelong commitment? Yeah. Yeah. So there's basically two types of medications. One is fast onset, short duration. So something like a lot of people use trazodone for vet visits, for example. So that is fast onset. It'll be effective basically within 60 to 90 minutes. And then it's usually gone and out of their system by eight to 12 hours. So if you have an acute event that, and if that's enough, that might be good enough. But for dogs who have chronic anxiety issues or maybe like personality trait or anxious, then that's where we talk about our maintenance or quote unquote longer lasting medications like generic Prozac is the most popular or common where you take it once every day and it reaches a steady state and you continue taking it once every day. There's definitely a lot of patients where we use medications, we intervene with a lot of behavior mod, the dog develops different behavioral habits and maybe different management strategies and owners are happy. And if they're happy and stable for a year, two years, and then people are like, they seem changed, they, they're still quirky, but we're good with this. Then we can also wean them off at that point and see if the habits stick now that they're I don't know, five, six years old. So all of them can be used short-term, long-term, depending on the needs of the pet, the pet parents, the environment. Okay. And you mentioned working breeds. And I saw on your page that you are in sport. You train in sport, it looks like, or uh, yeah. maybe trialing. Yeah, I have a personal obsession with bite sports. So I am I trained my older Doby in Schutzen IGP. She's retired now, so now it's her daughter that I'm training in IGP. Would you say that involvement of the higher drive breeds that were bred for displays purpose, bred to respond to stimuli, would you say that's given you a slightly different perspective than maybe some of your peers in the industry? I think I've, so that's a good question. Am in behavior because of my first really problem child dog who was a Doberman mix and she was pathologically dog aggressive. Like nothing really triggered her other than the presence of another dog. So it was just like straight dog aggression. Um, 
And so because of her, I've developed a really deep understanding of management failures, of behavior mod, of arousal. And so because of her, I developed that and I, I enjoyed it. And so because of her, I like playing with fire <laughs> and I like working with arousal. So I think that probably differentiates me from a lot of people, but that's what my personal interests are like I like the adrenaline rush of a dog and high drive yeah so I guess you could say that just makes me different from quite a few people yeah it's it's similar I think good I think a trainer even that's obsessed with behavior modification oftentimes we start taking on the higher drive dogs they just have a lot they don't know where to put it or it misfires Mm -hmm. And so you do fall in love with working breeds and you do fall in love with crazy and Mm -hmm. you do like to crank and calm and play with fire, as you mentioned. Do you see, I know I'm answering a question that I already probably had the answer to, but specifically in the Bay Area, obviously working breeds have become extremely popular. Mm -hmm. Uh, Malinois are extremely popular and now Dutch Shepherds Mm -hmm. um, are everywhere. Do you experience right breed, wrong home and If so, what do you do there in your line of profession, meaning a dog that's a lot and it was a lot more than what the home got in for or bargained for? What what would be your approach there? Yeah, these are complicated also because like I think about my experience with my old Doby mix and she was a lot. I, I still to this day feel like she was the most I will comfortably ever have. I enjoyed rising to the occasion and I realized like I am in probably an outlier in that. And so I do have some clients where it's a lot of dog, but they've enjoyed rising to the occasion and it it ultimately worked well for them. And almost all dogs, like once they reach middle age, five, six, seven years old, things do shift and, and they do go through developmental changes and a lot of them become much more livable and so I think the really challenging part is when they're no longer cute puppies and small and when they're not lovely mature six to seven year old a lot of dog but more mature six to seven year old dogs so in that five six year time span that's when a lot of it breaks down and it and I think if you have a family that is interested in rising to the occasion at least a little bit, then we can talk about ways to make it more doable. Like you don't have to wear out the dog physically every day. There's a lot to be said for enrichment and problem solving and self-control exercises. And it may be a lot of work, particularly from year one to year three, but after that, things get a little bit easier. Are you capable of doing that? Do you want to do that? But then ultimately, I think if it's a bad fit and there are bad fits, then we go through the options of your option one is to keep the dog. And if you do keep the dog, these are the things that you'll probably need to do to make life livable for both of you. If you don't want to keep the dog, then there's rehoming. If you rehome, do you return to breeder? Do you return to shelter? Do you privately rehome yourself? And this is like a whole like class in and of itself because there's so many things to consider in rehoming a dog and especially if the dog has any kind of defensive or worse bite history like what does that actually mean because you are to an extent liable if you rehome a dog with a potential defensive aggressive history or with a bite history and then as I touched upon a little bit early behavior euthanasia, but I don't, I don't think that is something we commonly have to talk about. Like, I think when the need is there, we talk about it, but that is not something we commonly have to talk about. So in the rehoming issue for, let's say, high drive, working dog, not a great fit family, I don't think there's any shame and saying this is not the right dog for me, but it might make a great dog somewhere else. And there are some programs, some rescue organizations where they're looking for that type of dog. Canines for Conservation, they specifically take dogs who are rehomed for being too much dog, too much drive, 
generally socially stable. So there are certain things that need to be met for a dog to do well in that organization. But there, there, there are options, right? Yeah, I think it's a lot of factors. And I do feel like there will always be that working dog that people want. It's before my time, it was probably Rotties and then Dobies and then German Shepherds were super popular for when I was a kid. And now I think it's shifted to Malinois. And like you said, Dutchies, I don't know, it's probably going to flip to like Border Collies and and whatever next. I You can't predict these things, I think. <laughs> So with working breeds, it sounds to me also like you have a bit of a, an experience. You love the breed. And I know personally, when people see me, they have spent the time. They've already gone through a couple of trainers. So the commitment is there. And oftentimes the unlock is just celebrating the dog's strengths, helping them see the talent the dog has and utilizing that as to maybe have a journey with the dog, get the dog an outlet that it so desperately looks for. Mm -hmm. How far do you go with those types of things? Do you involve them potentially with talking about agility or bite sport? Do you talk about tug work or float pull work as a means of an outlet? Like where do you, how far do you lean in when it comes to those scenarios? Yeah. So I think that I'm always trying to think of externalities or maybe unforeseen unintended consequences. So I think I would start out, let's say you have a high drive dog in a pet home who's a little bit overwhelmed. Like the first thing I would look at is what is your daily routine and what alterations might I make to that daily routine to make management easier. And then I would hone in on the exercise that the dog is getting because the answer isn't always like exercise more and the answer is not more leashed walks, right? I like I cannot emphasize that enough. You do not need more leashed walks. And maybe it's my personal bias, but as an example, like my dogs are almost never walked on leash. They're walked on leash when they're injured and they need exercise restriction or we're going into town and they have to be on leash or I'm just super busy slash lazy that day and I have time to take them out. So sorry, you guys get to sniff around the neighborhood. So for me, leash walks are like my last resort. I still train them for it, but it's really not enriching for dogs in many situations, unless you specifically make the effort to make it enriching for them. So we look at exercise and we really talk about it. And if it's a high toy drive dog, which is amazing, love them, then yeah, we go into a little bit about toy play. And I really, I don't know if Shade White Soul, but way back when, I think she was the first to really introduce me to the idea of toy marker cues and how you can incorporate that into basically like self-control exercises that lead into obedience and etc. And so I really like toy marker cues and I really like coming at it from the point of view of self-control offered behaviors really good engagement with the handler. And so we talk about that. And if the owners can take that like foundational nugget and run with it, then we talk about more complex things. Like how do you use it as a reinforcer for a complex behavior, stuff like that. But if they aren't super mm, committed to all of that, I'm not going to be like, yeah, you have a Malinois, you should do bite work because it's not, it's not like that. (laughs) right? Like for our sport, there's three phases and only one of them involves biting. And if you actually trial, the biting amount is so limited. Like it's not about biting. It's really about obedience and tracking first. And then in protection, it's about control and it's about clarity and social confidence and all of that. So if they just want to get into it for biting, and I say this for all newbies, and you see it all the time, if you want to just get into it for biting, okay, go play tug with your friend and have fun with that. But it's much, much more than that. Yeah. Yeah. I I think the same sort of angle is taken with my clients, which is there's no point to cranking a dog unless you're working on the calm, the capping, but more importantly, the toy can be a party at first, but once it's a party, then it's about working towards that toy and those complex mm-hmm. behaviors, helping with the regulation and helping with the outlet piece. Cause it's the ask that wears the dog yeah. out. It's the, 
you know, not the yeah. lunging for a tug. They it's the literally like one to five minutes of working their self control that tires them out. So absolutely, if owners would like to start with the toy foundations and then add layer things on, then I'm like, yeah, I am here for you. I'll guide you. But if they just want to start with the beginnings, I'm like, that's better than nothing too. And that's going to set you up for the future. So let's just start there. But we don't really talk about like, how do you use it for sports and blah, blah, blah until like, you got to show me that at least the foundation nuggets. Right. Can we get into a little bit of the science piece? Sure. Absolutely. I'm I'm really curious. I'm curious. I'm being greedy here because my brain has, since talking to you and for the last year and a half, maybe two years, I've come across particular dogs and started to recognize limitations with my process with a couple of various scenarios. And I don't have a background in education. I I study as much as I can. I'm involved in Joe Rosie's Behavior Bible, Mm -hmm. which is a pretty intense science, canine science curriculum. Yeah. Yeah. But in terms of brain makeup issues and the various brain makeup issues that you might have, there's lots of terminology for various brain makeup issues. Mm-hmm. People might refer to it as retriever rage syndrome or just rage syndrome. Some people might say threshold sensitivity. But what I'd like to know is for the dogs out there where they cross over mentally, mm-hmm. the areas of the brain that might be a little bit more predominantly in charge of predatory sequences, uh, conflict seeking behaviors, Mm -hmm. engage. And for whatever reason, the lights aren't on uh, Mm -hmm. when that happens. Don't recognize their owner, don't recognize the situation, and they perceivably lose control and go into those aggression uh, sequences. Um, Where do you, I guess, where does your process go with dogs that do have chemistry issues up top, upstairs? Sure. One of the easiest ways that I can explain it is we all have impulses and dogs have impulses and impulsive behavior. And you can define it as like acting without thinking and that thinking part that inhibits the impulse. So the impulse exists and you need your prefrontal cortex to inhibit it. And that's how neural circuitry works is it's through excitatory inhibitory mechanisms. And so if we all have this impulsive tendency, let's say, and really what distinguishes us is our prefrontal cortex and humans have really well-developed prefrontal cortex and dogs as well. So if that comes primarily from the PFC And there's just some dogs where that seems to be weaker. They actually have looked at brain slides of dogs who were diagnosed as having impulse aggression, for example, versus normal dogs. And they do see that they have less inhibitory pathways. So if you look at it like that, then the answer of medications is that For whatever reason, and the exact mechanism is not known, but for whatever reason, serotonergic medications have been shown to improve in reducing aggressive displays and basically improving reducing impulsivity in dogs. So the exact pathway is unclear, but we do know that they seem to have neural circuitry that makes them more impulsive or vice versa, less prefrontal cortex inhibition. And adding serotonergic medications seems to improve that inhibitory process. Why exactly? We're not sure, but we can see that structurally. So your answer is that one day we'll figure out exactly why, which exact inhibitory pathways or neurotransmitters are impacting what impulsive pathways, but we do know that on brain slides, in case studies, in like basically studies of cases, like multiple cases, not just a single case, that serotonergic medications like fluoxetine specifically have been studied and shown to show an improvement. And so then you might wonder then, is this actually related to underlying anxiety neural pathways? Because if you think about anxiety, 
and I always make this distinction for my clients, there's a difference between anxiety and fear. Fear is a normal adaptive process that causes a negative emotional reaction so that you can respond to deal with whatever that stimulus is. So it makes sense for me if I'm alone in a parking lot and I see some guy approaching me, and no offense to men, but let's say I'm alone in a parking lot, there's a single man approaching me, he's staring me down, and I don't have anything around me, I'm going to feel fear of him, but it makes sense that I should feel fear of him because I'm alone, I don't know this person, he's coming at me, he's looking at me. So It's an observable stimulus that anyone can sense, see, hear, smell, taste, whatever. And it makes sense for someone or a dog to be afraid of that. Um, And in one study, basically dogs are supposed to be afraid of new dogs. And so they showed more fear responses to a new dog versus an unfamiliar dog. So things like that make sense. That's normal. That's adaptive. Anxiety, especially if maybe it's a personality trait or it's a prolonged state, starts to become potentially maladaptive because let's say I'm back at that parking lot and I had that experience with that man and now nothing is around me again, but it's just me in a dark parking lot and nothing is around me. But now, whether because I am naturally anxious or whether because of that negative prior experience, my heart starts to go up, I start to be hypervigilant and I start to be very aroused and anticipating, worrying that something will happen. And that's what defines anxiety is that anticipation, that worry. And so even if there is nothing around me, I feel this way and I'm hyper vigilant. And so if a plastic bag flies across the parking lot, I might look <gasps> startle and be afraid of that, of a neutral object because I am in a hyper vigilant state. And so that's what makes anxiety challenging. And that's why if we have a a patient or a dog who is chronically in that state, there's almost no use talking about desensitization because I'm actually sensitizing to neutral things because I am anxious. And so let me talk about impulse aggression, for example, and why serotonergic medications help. Potentially, maybe that's a facet of underlying anxiety, that the dog is always in this chronic anticipation of something bad happening, and they lack inhibitory control, then you have a dog that lashes out at everything. So that's my long-winded way of starting to dig into all of this. (laughs) No, it's a beautiful answer. It's not long-winded at all. I, I so appreciate it. What about a sensory sensitivity? What about when a dog's Richter scale hits on routine or even novel sounds? I've noticed sometimes dogs, and it sounds almost similar to what you were talking about, Mm -hmm. a hypervigilance. However, uh, the dog might be too tuned into, let's just say, for instance, sound sensitivity. And so they're constantly hearing every sound, dedicating their surveillance, and more or less in that anticipatory place of anxiety Mm -hmm. and the odd sounds potentially sending them over further and further over threshold to the extent that a car door can shut and the dog will go into a display. Yeah. Yeah. And noise reactivity is and noise phobia are definitely things. And there is an FDA approved medication for thunderstorm phobia, for example, cilio. It's, uh, it's an alpha two agonist, and it's like microdosed. So it's, it's a version of a common sedative that we use for dogs, but it's microdosed. So in theory, it only acts in the brain and doesn't produce physiological effects. And I have a lot of noise reactive dogs where we try cilio and then try a desensitization counter conditioning session and it's like markedly improved. Obviously they're experiencing some kind of really intense emotional distress and Does the fear drive the anxiety or is there an underlying personality trait of anxiety that heightens the fear and then it becomes this feedback cycle of anticipation? I'm not sure. I don't know if anyone is, but we do seem to see that they are responsive to certain medications that help tone down potentially that anticipatory drive, that anticipatory anxiety, allowing them to finally feel comfortable enough to desensitized counter condition because these were dogs that 
One, for example, was a really fantastic owner. She took really great training videos, sent them to me. I gave her adjustments and it was like, this is really hard for this dog. Like just opening and shutting your drawers is really hard. And we tried Cilio and it was just, it wasn't like a calm dog, but it was like a functional dog. It was a dog who was responding to desensitizing counter conditioning truly. And so that really helped us to see proof of concept. There's something there that is extremely distressing and adding Cilio, interestingly, did allow her to lower that anxiety threshold enough so that she could absorb what we were trying to teach to feel comfortable, essentially. That's amazing. So that's so interesting because if I or another behavior mod trainer or even an owner dedicated to a desensitization, sound desensitization, it is a bit of a longer road aside from puppies and exposure work, especially with a dog that's already in the bleachers as opposed to home plate when it comes to fear, a medication improving not only the process, but the quality of the process. And mm -hmm. would you say that it potentially shortens the length of these desensitizations? Yeah. So my story that I like to share also <laughs> is my younger Dobie puppy. She tore her ACL and she needed a underwater treadmill to recover. And she likes water, but, and she got in the tub okay. But I don't know if you've ever seen an underwater treadmill. People don't actually tell you. It's, it's scary. I would be scared if I were a dog. They shut you in a tub and then the water slowly rises up from the bottom. I would think I was drowning. <laughs> And then after they slowly almost drown you, the ground starts moving after a very loud noise. So of course it's scary. And she was like, what the hell? And the first time I think was a little traumatic. The second time we were like, oh, let's try to shape her in and we'll slowly take it step by step. But she was like, oh, hell no. And so then the third time I was like, she needs help. She is not getting better. She needs help. She's probably becoming anxious. What can I do? So I gave her a little bit of clonidine and a very low dose of trazodone. Honestly, I, I don't really like trazodone, but I, I felt it might be nice to help her be just a little bit like a little bit sleepy for this first time. And and with those two additions, they were not enough to really change her energy attitude at all. But with those two additions, it gave us enough of this open door for her to be like, do I hate this? Am I dying? And then we quickly followed up with a ton of food and, and everything to be like, no, you're fine. It's great. Don't worry. And then so that was the first kind of shift. And then the second time, same thing, same doses, again, shaping her. And then she was like, okay, I think it's okay. And then we keep trying to change her emotions. And then now she's no longer on, I think after the, so that was like fourth, I think after the fifth time, we didn't medicate her anymore. And she got in just fine because she is a little bit more resilient. She has more background, but intervening at that moment when we start to see the anxiety climb and opening that door to allow her to be like, how do I feel about this? I'm not sure. To take down that anticipatory drive and be like, don't think too much. Just eat, right? <laughs> just feel good. Just eat. Don't think too much. That allowed us to just like entirely shift her relationship with it. And now we're fine. Now she goes in the treadmill, does her thing, eats peanut butter, and then whatever. We're good. So that is... To answer your question, yes, exactly. It's if we have a lot of emotional distress driving this and the dog is getting into this like worry panic cycle, we should intervene there. And what interventions you use, that's where you need to know the dog. What are you using it for? What drugs are you using and what are their effects? Like that's where you can really start shaping it to approach more what we would like. I think that what I'm realizing is the inherent, I guess, uh, one, I don't think trainers know a lot about what be vet behaviors do um, and where they lean in and how they lean in. Because even listening to you, I can be honest and say that there's probably a lot of assumptions that medication is about improving the dog's quality of life and letting them ride this thing out and they're going to be medicated forever. But what you're talking about is 
timing being really important with medication mm-hmm. to complement the process so that you can potentially shorten the length of time that your you know effort and time is being put into that process. With that said, because I'm thinking about all the times that I work transplants in San Francisco, which is a common case that I get. Mm-hmm. My Australian shepherd was fine in the suburbs of Arizona, but now my wife has a job at Kaiser Permanente and we're downtown San Francisco and the dog is losing mine at every little sound. Yeah. Now I'm thinking that it would be more efficient. We talk about effective versus more effective. It might be more effective to refer out so that a vet behaviorist can help that dog cope and not worry about the quality of life, the quality of the dog's circadian rhythm, if you will, being compromised by this really intense transition. Mm -hmm. So with that said, how do I find a good vet behaviorist? (laughs) I would imagine just like with training, there's a spectrum of Mm -hmm. talent and capability and experience and obviously everyone in the field has credentials Mm -hmm. but what where do i start in vetting a good vet behavior so that i can feel confident that they'll be able to steer my dog and more often than not land a successful process like how do you qualify a a person in your area yeah yeah so Whenever we talk, like my brain goes in 50 different directions and I'm like, oh, I want to touch on that. But okay, then you went this direction. I'm like, oh, I want to touch on that. So, <laughs> you can so, circle back. Okay, yeah. okay. So let's start with boarded behaviorists. Bed behaviorists, what I call a vet behaviorist is someone who is a, primarily a veterinarian. So they have their veterinary degree and then they get special training in behavior and then they become a boarded behaviorist. I went through that special training with two boarded behaviorists. I am not boarded at the moment. And there's a lot of us who have gone through that special training and who are either in the process of studying for boards or who have not gotten boarded yet or whatever. I would say that if you want to go straight to boarded behaviors, it's easy. You go to dacvb.org and those are all the diplomates. They often have a lot of residents or people who have gone through training with them, like myself. And so we may not show up on DACVB. We may be a little bit harder to find. And but sometimes you will you will get referrals through your primary vet. So very often primary vets know who's in their area, whether it's a DACVB or their resident or someone they trained. So you can either go to DACVB.org or you can talk to your primary vet and ask for referrals. One thing I wanted to touch upon was in my perspective, I fully believe that if there's good justification for medications, like the example with my puppy, like clearly she was getting worse and she was getting more anxious and it was like, something's got to change. She's not going to DSCC to this. Like she feels panic. So when there is good justification, we can talk about medication options and we can talk about, is it appropriate? And we can talk about what is the efficacy because, for example, fluoxetine, which is doggy Prozac, sorry, Reconcile, which is doggy Prozac, which is fluoxetine, they're all the same thing, basically. For example, that was approved for separation anxiety. So it's FDA approved, but efficacy is about 70%. And so if you have 100 dogs with separation anxiety and you put them all on Reconcile, which is FDA approved for this condition, about 30 won't respond at all. And so I want people to be clear about what is possible, what are their goals, and what are the limitations of what we have in modern medicine at this time. And hopefully if you talk with a boarded behaviorist or someone they've trained, you'll be able to have these really true conversations about this is your dog, whether due to genetics, rearing, whatever. And this is what we have available to help. These two things may help you, and this is how it may help you. If it does not help you, these are our other options. So just like coming in with it with a really clear head. And then the other thing that I wanted to touch upon, because you mentioned, mentioned transplants, and I used to practice in San Francisco also. We would have a lot of those, but I would often find, like I remember this one case from Texas. He lived on an acre in Texas, and the dog was always anxious, but it was just like, meh when you're in Texas on an acre, right? Like the dog is anxious, but okay, there's not many things to be afraid of now. But when they moved to 
San Francisco, then it was like, now this is a big issue. Dog won't go outside to potty. So I, I wonder in those cases, maybe it was always there, but it just didn't matter as much. <laughs> Yeah, and I know that for what I do in those cases, because I live in Benicia, so I can almost be like a toes in the water, getting them exposed mm-hmm. to a smaller version of San Francisco's smaller stimulations and sound yeah. and movement, doing some environmental pattern games and then cranking mm-hmm. the dial a little bit. But yeah. I, I often wonder, because you have me thinking now, where, for efficiency's sake, where do we stop as dog trainers and search out a vet behaviorist in our area to establish a relationship? Because honestly, when I talked to you on the phone and you said, I prefer that my clients have a trainer or are in the process, I just assumed that it was a handoff. Here you go. This is a, mm-hmm. I'm referring it out high and by scenario. I didn't think of it as a collaboration. And I guess the question, is it routinely a collaboration or is it just a handoff mm-hmm. giving the baton to the best? No, I would say in general, we aim to collaborate because I think in general, we aim to say, this is our assessment. These are our recommendations, but we can't handhold you through this because that would take up a lot of time and money. And I think it would be better served if you could see a private trainer who can see you like once every two to three weeks to like be there with you or virtually be there with you and guide you. I do provide limited support after my consults. And that's just like what I've chosen to do in the way that I practice is I give them a certain time period and they have to use it within four months, for example. And so if they want to take training videos and send that to me and they are amenable to virtual coaching, we can definitely use their time for that. But I far prefer for them to have someone like you who will be like, let's meet up, let's go through a session. You're probably time and money too, but I feel like you have the specific focus on let's work on behavior mod right now and we're going to focus on that. Whereas I think a lot of times they come to us and they want to talk about Obviously, we have to talk about the history, but they want to talk about like the response to meds and stuff like that. And so we can help on that end, but you can help them focus in a session on behavior mod and okay, this is how your dog is on meds. Let's just start taking this data point and then reconvene with Sophie Lou about whether it's helping our behavior mod process or not. And so for me, I definitely prefer collaboration and I prefer for them to stay with their trainer and I just help on the meds or supplements or fine tuning a plan, whatever. But I prefer for them to have that relationship with you so that you can focus and hone in and and keep data and then we can work as a team. And I think most behaviors prefer that also. I also think most behaviorists are not as mm, training motivated as I am personally. And so I think that's another reason that a lot of them are like, stay with your private trainer. They'll go through the plan with you. I think it's based off a medical model. So like medical model and human psychiatry, for example, is probably your psychiatrist will talk about medications, but then ultimately you go to a licensed therapist or whomever to do your daily or weekly sessions or group classes, that type of stuff. So it's based off that model. That's funny because it's news to, I've worked with, I've contacted vet behaviorists in the past. I'm like, Hey, because I come in at the tail end of it, or the dog has been put on medication and I want to make sure I'm doing the right thing. Or I want to, the last case, the dog, I felt like the dog didn't need to be on medication. The dog was not able to track in the session. It looked like it was fogging the dog's ability to track in, but I couldn't get the vet behaviorist to get with me and perform those, like have a collaborative Mm -hmm. meeting. Importantly, I think maybe a lot of vet behaviorists such as yourself are extremely busy and you often hear clients say like vet behavior, it's a year out, it's seven months out, et cetera. Where do you think trainers can start with bridging the gap? How would I go about, we did it, but Mm -hmm. I use social media to find the rock star vet behaviorist in the Bay Area. But how does Susie Q or John Doe in Kansas or Seattle hearing this conversation and going, I feel like I'm going to establish a partnership with vet behaviors just so that I'm doing things correctly and just so that I've got all the resources at hand Mm -hmm. to make the best decision possible for my client. 
how would we go about reaching out and performing the handshake? Yeah, yeah. I think so first find the people to begin with. So DACVBs or people they've trained. And if it's not on the website, if there's no one local, then ask their primary vet for a referral. And let's say their primary vet refers them to me, then of course they can book. I think wait times were really quite bad during COVID for a variety of reasons, but that seems to have eased up some. So hopefully wait times aren't as long. There are also a lot of vet behaviorists who do remote consultations, so virtually. And for example, it's something that I do as well. So if the client has a primary vet who is at least open to the idea of behavior modifying medications and the primary vet is willing to prescribe, then we can create a four-way collaboration where let's say I take the history, I can help do the assessments, I watch their training videos and say, okay, this is what it looks like. In my opinion, from what I understand of this dog, mm-hmm. these medications are, are likely to be of benefit. Then we can send those to the primary vet to prescribe and then they keep working with their trainer. And so so I like I really prefer that people keep working with their private trainer, keep their relationship with you you already know the dog, you already have a good plan. And then I can help their brain be able to absorb things better. Hopefully, knock on wood. Okay. So it sounds like working through their primary vet, establishing that referral. Yeah. And then moving forward. Got it. Okay. That's really good to know. Yeah. Especially for people who aren't in the area, I would say, can you start with your primary vet and see who they refer for behavior focused vets? And if those wait times are long, then I'll say, okay, is there anyone offering remote consultations that you think might work for you? And then go down that route. But if, for example, they have a behavior issue that's like pretty black and white, like your client got a dog, it's been struggling for three months, and still to this day, they can't leave the house because the dog just freaks out. If it's a case like that, and we know we have FDA approved options like Reconcile, I would say like, just go to your vet, tell them what's going on. They'll probably start you on Reconcile and hopefully you'll be the 70% that does respond to it. And maybe that helps you in the interim. So I wouldn't hesitate to have those conversations either to be like video, if you can video, you leaving the house and yeah, you did it for five minutes and dog is just like absolutely panicked, right? That's pretty good evidence to show to a primary vet and be like, this is unsustainable. Is there a medication option? The answer is yes. There are FDA approved medications. Can we start on this? Would a vet feel, is it routine? Because I know a lot of times medication is prescribed by vets and it's, so is it routine? How often would a vet refer to a vet behaviorist compared to let's just start them on this medication and see how it works out? That is a really good question. I don't know the stats, but I've seen enough behavior history forms where I can see that some primary vets are more comfortable with it and they'll like, okay, yeah, this video clearly shows signs that are consistent with separation anxiety. I've used Reconcile before. Let's give it a try. And sometimes they're part of the lucky 70% that respond and that's it. I don't know the stats, but I think there are enough primary vets and there's enough familiarity with fluoxetine, Reconcile, Prozac, that a lot more primary vets are comfortable with that when there's good justification. So if there's good justification... We'll, we'll, got a last question for you and it's a doozy are you ready <laughs> sure hit me with it <laughs> what types of protocols and approaches in your experience complement medication better comparative to others so even myself i've got a couple of referrals coming to you right and potentially the dog will be put on a medication protocol and i myself am a trainer and saying okay once the dog is on medication, will I go back to obviously assessing to see how better the dog is responding to the various triggers, but will I be performing something more under threshold and working more of a 
BAT 2.0, CAT protocols, distance, really dipping the dog's toes in the water and trying to make a process happen with under threshold work? Or in my mind, would I use more communication and work the classic alternative behaviors, et cetera? So would you say that trainers should be versed with under threshold work, non-negotiable if? Yeah, good question. Everything is so complex. Everything could be like a six week long class. I know. Yeah. So my personal bias on threat, and we always talk about thresholds and I'm sure Amy Cook could talk your ear off about thresholds. My, from what I have seen, depending on what the issue is, I think I do tend to agree with Amy that a lot of times the threshold is not exactly what we think it is, because I think a lot of times even for a quote unquote normal dog with a normal fear, we push them to the point of showing a very overt indicator of avoidance, dislike, whatever. And they're so far above that threshold already that I don't think that what we are doing is necessarily changing an emotional response versus teaching like a coping with the stressor but like a kind of survival coping, not a, I'm okay with this. This is all right type of response. So I do think that my preferred protocol would be anything that tends to be extremely respectful of what that dog's true threshold probably is. And I think for a lot of social stressors, especially, which I define as people, dogs, maybe other animals, but for social stressors, I think that threshold is a lot farther than what we often believe it to be. And so so for those situations, for social stressors, for example, I do like to do maybe some version of look and dismiss, because if they can show me at a healthy, comfortable distance that they can disengage from it, then I like to stay there or maybe farther back from there. So I don't have a specific protocol that I'll be like, for people fear, I always recommend that. Or for dog fear, I always recommend the pattern game. But I I do anything that has a really healthy sensitivity to what their true emotional threshold is and also doesn't try to mask it in in other ways like doesn't try to mask it with asking for eye contact or whatever like you can ask for the behavior of it's your choice type of thing and then layering in distractions but not compelling the dog to do a thing in the face of the stressor if that makes sense subtle difference it does make yeah. sense it yeah. totally makes sense we'll coin the protocol we'll call it the just keep swimming protocol yeah sure <laughs> sounds good <laughs> and we'll have a dory as shorthand yeah <laughs> no but that really does make sense because there's a lot of there's just a lot of clearly there's a lot of resources online and youtube and social media and a lot of train a lot of owners spin their wheels looking for the answer, looking for the holy grail, the sword and the stone, and they get mixed up with engagement, disengagement and focus games and moving to something a little bit more compulsionary, Mm e-collars. But what you're talking about is very simplistic. The whole goal is to, like you said, keep, give the dog the respect they deserve and not push them over the brink and teach them to freely walk about the cabin. Mm -hmm. And, Oftentimes what you're talking about too is being mindful of distance, being yes. mindful of stimulation, you know, mm-hmm. setting the dog up for success. So it really is a general take on under threshold work, if you will. Yeah, yeah. It should be a happy, free dog that is comfortable in the situation, thereby allowing you to push the challenge. You really shouldn't be dealing with a dog who's so-so and then you keep walking one step closer and closer. It should be a dog that's freely comfortable which is why I think Amy's could talk you, she could talk you for an hour about threshold and why she prefers her particular play way of being sensitive to that. And I think ultimately that's true for me too, whether you use play or whether you use food, it should be a happy dog in front of you who's, oh, there's a thing, Meh, whatever, let's keep doing our th- game, right? And if that is your ideal picture, however you get that, I think you're on the right track. 
I think you're forging a, a union with good training, which is whatever the process is, whether it's a forestry trainer, whether it's a, a balance trainer, whether it's a vet behaviorist, is that you, the end, end, end all be all goal is to make more dog and create a more enriched life. And whatever training gets you there is the appropriate path. So, yeah, I think if we can all recognize, like, what does a free, happy, responsive, engaged dog look like, then I think fundamentally all of our training will start to align. So I just appreciate the time. Honestly, I think there is a big gap with uh, what trainers know of vet behaviorists and what vet behaviorists are doing. And I think there's even, we don't realize that just as much as our industry is evolving and changing, so is yours. Mm -hmm. It's There's strides being made in, in every stretch of dog training. And so the closer we can be to each other, the more we might be able to recognize opportunities and use you guys as a, a reference, as a resource, as a referral, but more importantly, just stay a little closer. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. If your dog doesn't know. If we can all work together to help your dog, then I absolutely think that's the, I think communication always helps. It's the problem is, and I can speak personally, is that typically when you reach out for someone, it's when you've hit your max, when you're throwing your hands up and saying nothing I did worked. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I've taken away from this conversation is that's a little one, I probably drug in the dog a little farther in the process than need be, mm -hmm. that I should be more, mm -hmm. it should be more sensitive to how the dog is responding to my pivots and my reassessments mm -hmm. uh, and be looking to reach out uh, a little sooner and at least collaborate. It doesn't mean that I've lost, especially in your yeah. case where you really do appreciate the collaboration. It just means that I, I'm being more mindful and reaching out so that I have more support and being efficient yeah. you know, in the process. Yeah. So like my puppy with the underwater treadmill, like a good thing I intervened very early and I was like, I don't have any judgment about this. If she's panicking, she needs these meds at least for the next session. And then she was better. And then the next session she was better. And I'm like, okay, we can take you off the meds and now she's fine. So it, it's, it's not about, oh, I was wrong or this dog is defective or whatever. Like we throw them into really weird situations in our modern society. Most of them need some help in some way at some point. There's no ego involved. It's nothing about you're right, I'm wrong, I'm right, you're wrong. It's about the dog doesn't know any better, but the dog is struggling. So who do we have available to help us for this dog? And then if we all collaborate and we all communicate, I think it helps everyone. So I, I never think that communication is the wrong answer. I, I always think it's the right thing to do is to communicate. Well, this has been awesome. Thank you. I'm an Insta fan. Yeah, I'm, I, I really enjoyed this. This was extremely educational for me. So I just wanted to thank you for your time. This was fantastic. Thank you for having me. I love to chat. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye.